Tonight, Stonehenge, mysterious, monolithic, and now a crime scene. That the man was killed with a very sharp, probably steel blade. Can modern forensics shed light on this brutal beheading? I think if it was in this direction, the blade would come straight down. Investigators probe a murder at Stonehenge as we uncover Secrets of the Dead. Secrets of the Dead was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Stonehenge. These famous ancient ruins guard many mysteries. Who constructed them? When were they built? And what were they used for? Each bit of archaeological evidence provides scientists with new clues about the gaps in the historical record. But they often raise more questions than they answer. For Mike Pitts, the stones have provoked a passionate quest to uncover the missing history of this Neolithic monument. His work has helped redefine our understanding of Stonehenge's construction and of the role it has played in local cultures throughout the ages. He has spent a great deal of time examining the site but over the course of his archaeological career, he has been most captivated by the bodies of those who have died beneath the stones. One, discovered in the late 1970s, gave Mike a tantalizing but frustrating glimpse back to the earliest days of Stonehenge. This skull is from a man who died when Stonehenge was new. He might even have seen it being built. When the bones were excavated, three beautiful flint arrowheads were found scattered amongst his ribs and by his arms. And when they were examined back in the laboratory, it was discovered that these weren't arrows that were buried with him, an archer buried with his equipment, but they were the arrows that killed him. And the tip of one of these arrows is actually embedded in one of his bones. There's another tip of an arrow not represented in the grave in a different bone, and there are little nicks in a number of bones. Mike believes this man could have been the victim of a sacrificial ritual some 4,300 years ago. But he is hindered by the lack of evidence at the site from that period and has little hope of proving his theory. There is another body, however, originally discovered in 1923, that may have more to reveal. Found in a shallow grave, it seems to be the victim of a brutal ancient murder. Mike has high hopes that this body may unlock the secrets from a dark and enigmatic period of Stonehenge's past. Mike has spent much of his life trying to piece together the lost history of Stonehenge. Archaeologists know that the stone structures we see today are actually the result of an extended progression that began 5,000 years ago, during the Neolithic period. Over the following millennia, the monument was rebuilt and altered as changing populations adapted it for their own purposes. The first stones erected were blue stones, somehow transported 150 miles from the Preseli Mountains of South Wales. These were soon abandoned, however, in favor of huge sarsen stones from nearby Avebury, laid out in a circular pattern with a horseshoe inside. Several hundred years later, the smaller blue stones were again assembled within both the outer sarsen circle and the inner horseshoe. The stones align precisely with the position of the sun at the solstices. Mike believes that at some point, 
This alignment may have played a part in ancient ceremonies, where the recently dead were thought to make the transition to ancestors. Another theory, supported by the discovery of carvings on a number of the sarsens, proposes that the structure was used as a symbolic burial place, possibly for a mythical king or god. Archaeology provides clues, but time has done its best to bury the truth. Evidence of construction at the site ends in 1600 BC, but the first written mention of Stonehenge does not occur until almost 3,000 years later. Mike has hopes that his second skeleton can shed light on what happened during that forgotten period, perhaps redefining our understanding of this captivating icon. As an archaeologist working at Stonehenge, like anybody, I spend my time thinking about these magnificent megaliths. But it's strange now I turn my back on them and leave the circle. I'm walking out towards Amesbury and the location of this grave, which is down here. Crammed into a narrow grave less than two feet deep, this was the first complete skeleton ever recovered from Stonehenge. Stonehenge is unique. Anything buried in the ground at Stonehenge has to have had a special significance, and there has to be something very strange and special about the fact that people chose this particular spot to bury this particular man. The skeleton was discovered almost 80 years ago, during the largest excavation ever undertaken at Stonehenge. On November 3, 1923, Lieutenant Colonel William Holy who had been digging on the site for over three years, made the find. Using a now discredited technique based on race typing through skull shape, the skeleton was catalogued as a British man from the Roman period. It was assigned reference number 4104 and then filed away at England's Royal College of Surgeons. But in 1941, the college took three direct hits during the Blitz and the archives were almost completely destroyed. The Stonehenge skeleton was assumed to have been lost in the rubble. Until Mike Pitts arrived on the scene. He found correspondence that seemed to indicate the body had been moved to a storeroom in London's Natural History Museum. If he was right, the skeleton might have survived the bombing. The body sparked Mike's professional curiosity. He hoped it might provide him with rare insight into a period of Stonehenge's past that had all but been forgotten. He approached Jackie McKinley, an osteoarchaeologist, an expert on human remains, to examine the bones. Jackie quickly determined that the body was indeed 4104 and that he had been a healthy man in his 30s when he died. Oh, here he is then. He's not a big butch chap. He hasn't, I don't think he's done a lot of weightlifting. Stature-wise, yeah. um, well, he's shorter than you, basically. Should, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's if you, a, if you were to compare, that's, his, that's the femur, and if we were to... That's what, this way here? ...say, for instance, compare where... You see, your, your knee's actually considerably yeah. higher up than that. In fact, on, on, he's actually shorter than me. Shorter than you. So he's yeah. probably about sort of five, five, yeah. five-ish. I mean, we can take... We but can the take examination revealed a far more disturbing find. But the, the interesting thing that did strike me was in here. Now, these are the neck vertebra. That's what you call the atlas. That's basically right. what your head sits on, right. to the axis that it pivots on. But down through there, when you get to the fourth one down, it's, um, it's not quite all there. Something had sliced through the man's neck. There. This is the front of the vertebra. Where the, where the vertebral body is. That's where the spinal cord goes. This is the, the spine that you can feel at the back. As you can see, there's a very clean cut that's gone across that part of the vertebra. The cut suggested a gruesome death. So it's gone right across the, that hole in the middle, so yeah. it would have gone through the spinal cord. It would have cord. gone through the spinal cord, So if yeah. he wasn't already dead, he would certainly have been dead after that blow. a murder at Stonehenge. If the original classification of the body was correct, the deed had been done in Roman times, 
2,000 years after the monument was built. The Romans invaded Britain in AD 43 at the decree of the Emperor Claudius. Over the next 400 years, their armies sought to establish Roman law and culture throughout the territory. But many of the indigenous tribes resisted fiercely. Frequent conflicts resulted in many violent deaths. Within this volatile political context, the death of 4104 could have resulted from any number of scenarios. Mike hopes Jackie McKinley's analysis of the bones may be able to reconstruct the event. If we take cut vertebra, which is this one here, the fourth one, and the one above it, now I'm going to try and hold them the right sort of distance apart. And obviously right. there's a space between them because you've got to remember you've got the, the um, intervertebral disc in there. So there is a certain amount of space so between it. it's a very it. thin blade. It, it looks more like a blade than, say, something he really hefty like an axe, I suspect. Um, so something more like a sword or a machete? Yeah, a, 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 a real blade as opposed to a really heavy chop chopping thing, basically. Mm. And what it's done is gone through the top of that spiny bit and where these two bits would, would, would articulate, and it's cut that off there. Now, the fact that it hasn't damaged the vertebral body that's above it um, suggests that perhaps it didn't go all the way through, that it actually stopped at that stage. But by that point, it had gone through the spinal cord anyway. So quite a wide swinging blow that then was stopped short in the neck. Yeah. Jackie's examination shows the extent of the wound. The weapon had sliced through bone and flesh, and though it may not have completely removed the head from the body, 4104 would have died instantly. But to know if the beheading had actually taken place in Roman times, as the initial records indicated, Mike needs to determine the skeleton's exact age. He sends the bones to be radiocarbon dated, a complicated process that should take several weeks. In the meantime, he continues to explore the details of the man's violent death. We can see from the wound that the man was killed with a very sharp, probably steel blade. We don't have those before, say, 200 BC. It's certainly not contemporary with Stonehenge, uh, which is 4,000 years ago. On the other hand, if he was killed in the historic period, we'd expect to have a written record of that. So we can say, for the sake of argument, that he died before the Norman Conquest, before 1066. So we have this broad span of time within which this man might have died. And other things being equal, it seems to me the most likely context within that time span is going to be early Roman. Mike's deduction that the body was from Roman times is supported by the discovery of Roman pottery and coins near the grave. The few artifacts indicate that the Romans had been in the area, but give little insight into their activities. We know when the Romans came to Britain, there was a very complex religious tradition actively being practiced throughout the country. It varied greatly from one part of the British Isles to another. Finds at other locations revealed little about what use, if any, the Romans had for Stonehenge. A prevailing theory is that the Romans saw Stonehenge the way we do today, as little more than an interesting tourist destination. So we can't say that what was happening on settlements and on hilltops around Stonehenge was necessarily happening actually amongst the stones. Mike has a victim that he believes dates from Roman times, possibly evidence that something of importance was taking place at Stonehenge. But what? The answer may lie at Sirencester, a key Roman center 40 miles away. Originally known as Corinium Dubonorum, it was the second largest city in Roman Britain and was established around 43 AD, very soon after the Romans first arrived in the area. Here, in a large ancient cemetery, Mike's investigation has turned up three possibilities for a decapitation in Roman times a beheading during battle, an execution of a judicial sentence, or a rite in a funeral ceremony. Could one of these have resulted in the death at Stonehenge? Writings from the Roman historian Tacitus speak of Britain at that time as a complex collection of war-painted, chanting tribes. Skirmishes were frequent, and violent death was common. Might 4104 have died in a battle between the invading Romans and one of the British tribes.
Biological anthropologist Chris Newsell may be able to provide some insight. When someone is decapitated in battle, it's usually not a precision strike, and it'll come perhaps at a very unusual angle. Um, it, it will be directed perhaps more at the head and neck, and the neck just happens to be that entity which catches the main force of the blow. So it's a, it's a much more um, disorganized event in battle. There's also evident many times, there's other evidence in the body for previous injuries, um, injuries that would have perhaps disabled the individual, and then these craniofacial or these head and face and neck injuries are those that were meant to basically extinguish that person's life. Mike asks Jackie to determine if 4104 shows this evidence of battle. There were no other indications of trauma. Now what this would suggest is that this individual wasn't sort of attacked generally. It wasn't part of a skirmish because you might expect in that case to see other blows, other decapitations that I've seen that are obviously from that kind of scenario there are various other cut marks on the skeleton as well because people don't in those cases tend to just make one blow you tend to have a series of blows so it would suggest you've had one clean blow which to me suggests more something like an execution or a ritual execution <laughs> The absence of other wounds means death in battle seems unlikely. That leaves two other possibilities. One is a beheading ceremony performed in some Roman funerals. 5% of skeletons excavated at Roman cemeteries in Britain show signs of this ritual. I think that some of these are probably more sympathetic. Um, some of these are done from the front. They're done with multiple strokes of a small a tool, usually it looks like a knife of some description, and it suggests more an incising motion. When the head is removed, it's actually placed in the grave in an out of alignment, in an unusual position, usually at the foot end of, of the burial, um, either between the, the shins or, the, or the, um, the thighs, or maybe at the feet. This act is thought to be a rite of care and respect, performed on people who were otherwise ordinary citizens. Few records exist about the ceremony, but one prevailing theory suggests that the removal of the head was intended to free the body's soul. The key significance to Mike, however, is that it seems the head was always removed from the front, casting doubt that such a ceremony could have been responsible for 4104's beheading. His head had been hacked off from behind. It looks like what's happened is it's come up from this direction into the back of the neck. Right. Well, that's, that's assuming right. the person's upright, of course. Yeah, which so, so at the moment, if, we, we're not sure about. So if the man was standing up straight, if then it would be a, a swinging blow. Somebody's coming, up, coming from up from slightly behind, probably on that, if, you, if it's a right-handed person on that side, and would go in here. A blow from behind rules out a burial ritual. Mike is left with only one possible explanation for the body's condition an execution. The amphitheater at Sirencester provides useful parallels. If I sat here 18, 1900 years ago, could I have actually seen a beheading? Yes, yes, public executions mm. almost certainly took place at an amphitheater like the one we have here at Sirencester. And what would have been the occasion of an event like that? Well, probably it would be a, 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 a judicial execution. That would be the, the, the most obvious explanation. Um, a court hearing in the town, the governors come, trials held, decision, execution. And of course we, we've actually got the skulls here in the cemetery just a few hundred meters from the amphitheater which kind of bear out the fact that something like this might have taken place here. Around the time of the Stonehenge beheading there is written evidence that the Romans publicly executed a local leader in northern France. Mike believes his victim could also have been a man of importance at the time of the Roman occupation. Perhaps he was head of an indigenous British tribe, executed as an example at the ominous monument of Stonehenge. It 
it's almost like doing a detective work, really. You would work towards most probable cause, the same way as somebody does in detective work, except you don't have any witnesses to help you. Even without witnesses, solid forensic evidence can still be assembled. To strengthen his theory that 4104 was an indigenous tribal leader executed by the invading Romans, Mike needs to determine whether he was, in fact, from Britain. To do so, he has a premolar from the side of 4104's jaw extracted and prepared for analysis. Premolars are heavily enameled and trap valuable information about a person's geographic origins. Teeth are very resilient. They survive very well in the ground. Often in archaeological burials, they are the only thing left that survives. The durability of the enamel acts as a time capsule, storing detailed information about what people eat and drink as their teeth form during childhood. We analyze the isotope ratios in the teeth, which characterize the tooth, and then we go and find some geology that would actually tie in with that so we can source them back to a particular type of, of geology where their food was being grown and where their water was being collected. The geology of the United Kingdom is diverse. Adjacent areas can have completely different chemical characteristics, so a move from one area to another would result in very different minerals being absorbed into the teeth. The isotope ratios you get from your food and water would be, would be very different, so we can actually track somebody's movement uh, over quite small scales. In order to get an accurate reading about 4104's origins, the team needs to make sure that the tooth had not been polluted after the man died. Mike returns to Stonehenge to obtain a soil sample from the gravesite. If the sample turns up abnormal levels of minerals from the area, or if the soil readings are exactly the same as those from the tooth, it will indicate that there may have been contamination, rendering the tooth sample useless. The original excavation diary noted that the body seemed to have been unceremoniously crammed into a narrow scrape less than two feet deep. Struggling with the hard earth, Mike realizes how difficult it would have been to dig the grave. This is pretty tough. I guess when they, when they dug the grave all that time ago, it wasn't a pleasant job. Um, they would have been using spades, possibly pickaxes, and they would have hit this stone in the same way that I have. Um, they might have been in a hurry. Who knows, maybe the man himself had to dig the hole. Yeah. It was. Uh, not long enough to take his body and they clearly were in a hurry to get it over with I suppose it wasn't a pleasant job for anyone I'm gonna stick this right into the center of the core of the soil so we can get a, a clean soil sample the results are good there has been no contamination Mike can now confidently proceed with the interpretation of the tooth data This map summarizes the strontium and oxygen data that we can refer to in interpreting the data from the teeth. The red contours here are contours of oxygen drinking water composition across Britain. The tooth that we analyzed had a value of minus 7.4, right. which places it within this broad tract in the center of Britain. However, if you look at the strontium composition of the tooth, which is going to reflect the person's diet, the water he drinks, the food he eats. That's related to the underlying soil and geology. Right. And using that, we can, we can restrict his, his likely childhood much more closely. He had a very low value for strontium. So from the strontium alone, he could have lived in this area here or here. And if you then combine the, the oxygen and the strontium, the only areas where they overlap in Britain are in this area here. So that, that's suggesting quite strongly that the man is fairly local, that he comes from somewhere within southeast England. Yes. Um, or near the south coast. And in fact, Stonehenge itself is actually inside that, is that in yellow that area, zone. area, yes. Mm. The tooth data indicates that 4104 could well have lived near Stonehenge, supporting Mike's theory that he was a local man killed by the Romans. 
but Mike still needs to confirm when the man had lived. Unfortunately, there has been a problem with the samples that were sent for carbon dating. At each stage of the chemical pretreatment, we do various quality control checks to test that the yields and the isotope ratios and so on are exactly what we would expect. And of the two samples which have been prepared, um, one of them has, has passed all those checks and, and one of them hasn't. And so I hope that we will get a result, assuming that uh, nothing goes wrong at the later stage to the remaining sample. While the carbon dating resumes, Mike is surprised to discover that a much earlier dating of the body has already been done. A quarter of a century before Mike rediscovered the bones, a now deceased amateur archaeologist named Whiston Peach had somehow tracked them to London's Natural History Museum, driven by the theory that 4104 was actually the skeleton of the renowned King Arthur. Today, folklorists generally agree that the legend of Arthur has its roots in the Dark Ages, the period between the end of the Roman occupation and the zenith of the Anglo-Saxon era. But Peach had a different theory. Based on his interpretation of a Welsh text, he believed Arthur had been a Neolithic king, contemporary with the construction of Stonehenge. In 1975, Peach had paid for a private radio carbon dating of the skeleton. For Mike, Peach's controversial Arthur theory is less interesting than the result of the test. Though many carbon datings from the 1970s are now considered unreliable, Peach's data, if it can be located, might provide a clue to the age of 4104, while Mike waits for his own more accurate results. Though the official lab records from Peach's test no longer remain, there is a letter that indicates a date. Now, I hear you found some letters from Weston Peach. I have, yeah. Um, not, not a lot, I have to say, but amazingly from the 70s, there are, there are a couple of letters. Well, that's more than we had before. Well, that's right. Hopefully yeah, enough to right. tell Mike if he's on the right track. Though Peach approached the museum almost three decades ago, head of paleontology Chris Stringer remembers his visit. Now, a couple of letters here from 25 years ago or so. Right. I recall... Wiston Peach coming here. He was a nice old chap, very enthusiastic. He must have been quite persuasive. Uh, he certainly so. had his agenda, let's put it that way. Mm. Uh, and as I recall, obviously he had views on King Arthur, that Arthur was linked in with Wales, that Arthur was linked in with Stonehenge, and that as I seem to remember, that Arthur was actually a very ancient figure, much older than anyone believed, and, and that these legends actually dated back to pre-Roman times. So his request to us was that there was this skeleton from Stonehenge. He wanted it to be absolutely dated by radiocarbon. Uh, we permitted him to take a sample for dating at, mm -hmm. at Harwell, which he was prepared to pay for. And they came back with, with a date, which he gives here as a provisional date. So I don't know whether um, you... Uh, the date they got date. was 760 AD. Now, I remember him being very disappointed at that date. It, it wasn't what he wanted. Well, he would have wanted, what, 2000 He BC wanted a much older date, certainly yeah. pre-Roman. The date and also cast doubt on Mike's theory that 4104 had been executed in Roman times. Well, that, this is a real tease, because on the one hand, it, it looks like a precise date, but on the yes. other hand, without the details, and with this word provisional, mm. it, it's, it's actually, to me, it's saying, I can't even assume now that the guy was Roman. Yes. Up to this point, I was imagining he was Roman. I think now, perhaps, I might mm. say, he mm. could be Roman or he could be Saxon. Yes. That's opened up the... The okay. time span even more. Until this point, Mike's investigation had led him to believe that 4104 was the victim of a Roman execution, and he still expects his modern dating tests to prove him right. But the peach date means he must now also consider the possibility of a later killing in Anglo-Saxon times. In the third century, the combined effects of plague and barbarian invasions were beginning to weaken the Roman Empire. Rome began relocating troops to its mainland borders, and by 410 AD, Britain had all but been abandoned. It was the beginning of the Dark Ages, a time of desolation and confusion in Britain. Fierce tribes from Europe, including the Angles and the Saxons, began crossing the North Sea to conquer the Britons and settle the land. Over the next 200 years, these pagan invaders gradually carved out numerous kingdoms, including Northumbria, East Anglia and Wessex. By the seventh century, the Anglo-Saxon rulers had consolidated their kingdoms and established their dominance over the local peoples. The weapon they used in their conquests was a long, heavy broadsword. 
the Romans had favored a shorter, lighter gladius. Mike hopes that difference will provide clues that will allow him to reconstruct the events of the execution. An experimental archaeologist is there to try and fill in the gaps that can't be answered by any other method. David Sim is a weapons expert, a specialist in swords. If you think about an execution being carried out in the time period where this individual was probably executed, it's going to be an, probably an execution that was done on the spot. There was no great preparation. And if you want to decapitate somebody and axes aren't the normal part of your equipment, then you're going to use whatever comes to hand. And a sword is going to be the weapon of choice. Against an unarmed opponent, you'll take a head off really without too much trouble. The damaged vertebra shows a clean cut that did not completely sever the man's neck. This could have an important bearing on the type of weapon used in the execution. David plans to test both the Roman gladius and the Saxon broadsword, but he wants to begin with an axe as a basis for comparison. This time, it is a store-bought sheep's neck that gets the chop. When you use the axe, you get an enormous amount of energy it will go straight through a neck and I felt it would probably cut through two without any trouble at all. It's not the kind of wound that would be produced by an axe. The gladius was standard issue for Roman legionnaires. Designed primarily as a short one-handed stabbing weapon, could it deliver the cutting power needed to decapitate? Gladius is actually quite an easy weapon to use, and it's quite remarkable that when I struck double-handed blows and then single-handed blows, the amount of penetration was almost the same, which surprised me quite a lot. But certainly, if you couldn't take a head off with a single blow with a Gladius, you could cut seven-eighths of the way through. So it could have been the Gladius, the broadsword, was the primary weapon of the Anglo-Saxon warriors. Would it have been as effective? Well, the broadsword was certainly the easiest to use. Um, anybody who's reasonably skilled with a sword could take a head off with that without any trouble at all. If you look at something like the edge that's on a sharpened gladius and the edge that's on a broadsword, they're virtually identical. The weapons test clearly shows that either the Roman gladius or the Anglo-Saxon broadsword could have been used. Mike returns to the skeleton to look for other clues. Jackie has found a small chip on the lower jaw that seems to align with the lethal neck wound. If these adjacent injuries were made at the same time, they might reveal important details about how 4104 was executed. On the underside of the mandible, here, there's right. a tiny little nick, quite a, sh right. quite a shark, yeah. can you see that? Yeah. So that's basically in here. Right. Okay, so it's, so it's quite very, close to the ear. Yeah, it's just very underneath. corner yeah. of the mandible there. If I can just swap fingers round. Okay, and I'll bring up the jaw. Right. So tell me where yeah. to put this. It'd be roughly there. Right. Okay. Which is, which brings the two cuts onto yeah. the same level. The cut to the vertebrae is here, and the little nick on the mm. mandible is there. The chip on the jaw and the cut vertebrae suggest two possible positions, standing upright or kneeling with head outstretched. Do you think the bones can help us actually tell what position the whole body was in? Well, the, the only way to really do that is test various ways round, because obviously this could have worked in two ways. If, say, this man was attacked by an assailant from behind and that, that blow came up and it would come up at that angle, hit there, the person then moved slightly forward and maybe the head moved up slightly to one side because you wouldn't stand still if somebody hit you anyway. Alternatively, of course, if, you, if, if the head was down, so you, you're like that, and the blow's coming in from there, so it's coming in from that side again, you would still have to have the head slightly moved slightly to one side and up. Mike favours Jackie's second scenario. Based on the evidence from Sirencester, he believes 4104 was killed in a controlled execution, but he assembles a team of experimental and forensic archaeologists to work through all the possible positions. Right away, the group challenges the execution theory. 
there isn't a way, I don't think, that you can produce a wound on this setup that has got the same characteristics as the wound on the existing skeleton. Mm, I agree. I think if it was in this direction, the blade would come straight down, and what we have is the vertebrae that slice in an angle. So it's most likely that the blade would have to come on an angle, yes. mm -hmm. given the position that mm -hmm. it was a single blow that hit the, the jaw as well. The jaw has to be elevated mm -hmm. so that it nicks the bottom of the jaw. Because it's angled, this, this is not a likely scenario. The upward angle prompts the group to turn away from a controlled situation and revisit Jackie's first theory of an unrestrained victim. If he's standing, then the sword blade is coming where? It's coming... And, and upwards. Which vertebra does it, does it the cut? Fourth. It's the fourth, fourth. vertebra. One, so it's two, three, four. So it's cutting there. Just, oh, just where? above the spine. Just, just there. Yeah, just exactly there. there. So it's got to go through there, mm -hmm. like that, Without and then it. catch him and then there. There. It, it's, it's possible. It is possible. Yeah. It's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's totally plausible. If this person is running and another person is running behind, and you catch a blow. Yep. And, and like the that. person might have noticed somebody behind him mm -hmm. approaching while he's running. And Mike's theory hangs in the balance left, until sword expert David Sim tips the scale back towards execution. Caught in that yes. place. I, I, I'm, I'm not happy that this was done when he was standing. Because okay. if he was standing upright, you've got to get your sword up here. Yeah. And, and, you, you, and you, you, you can't get any no. energy behind no. it. No. The minute your hands go above your shoulders, yeah. you lose you, that, you, that power yes. in the swing. Yes. Yeah. You, you, your arms and shoulders are in entirely the wrong position mm -hmm. to get any energy behind the weapon you're using. Just because you've got the ideal conditions doesn't mean that you'll actually produce the ideal blow. Mm. Mm. You, you, you can miss, yeah. and I think yeah. that I think that that's what's happened here. Yeah. Either with him, if he's kneeling to be executed, mm. then the executioner just delivered a not very good blow. Mm. The blow is ill-aimed. David argues that the man was kneeling, but with his head in an upright position. That's when the blow comes, yeah. and it catches him there. It goes through his spine. The point then takes that piece of bone out of his jaw that way. I, I'm, I'm convinced. I mean, you have a victim who is kneeling with a straight back. He can't yeah. run off. Somebody approaches him from behind quite fast, maybe a step or two forward, with a yep. very sharp sword. Yep. Yeah. They, they just, just they, nicks through they, instant death. Yes, yeah. they, they take a cut that yes. they mean po probably to decapitate him and they miss slightly. Yes. So the blade passes through his neck, kills him, takes a bit out of the jaw, and his head doesn't actually come off, no. but it's going to fall So the, the whole body would then and fall then forward, wouldn't the it? Thing falls forward. Flat. So that would explain why he was buried the way he was buried, with the head at a right angle to the rest of yeah. the body. And maybe he just fell on his face and they dug a hole just beside where he lay yeah. and rung mm -hmm. him in, kicked him into it. He's dead before he starts falling forward. Working with the model skeleton, the group finally comes to a conclusion that the killing was most likely a controlled execution. I keep thinking what sort of man this was. I like to try and visualize his face, his personality and his dress. But until we have a date, I have to stop myself getting too clear in my mind exactly who he was and what he was doing because that is going to profoundly affect the context of the individual, the sort of person he was. Mike has become immersed in this enigmatic investigation, and he hopes that modern science will ultimately help him bridge the centuries that have passed since the execution took place. All the archaeological evidence and forensic conclusions have given him enticing glimpses of the events of that day. But in the end, it is the carbon dating that will reveal whether his hunches have been correct. Finally, almost a year to the day after he rediscovered the Stonehenge skeleton, he gets a call that the results are in. I've got my ideas about what I think this date should be, um, based purely on archaeological judgment, but I admit there is virtually no hard evidence whatsoever. So it's pure intuition, and intuition of course goes wrong, so the date's going to be something else. So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of exciting. And I'm nervous.
Despite the initial carbon dating done by Whiston Peach, Mike still clings to his theory that the man was beheaded by the Romans somewhere between 43 and 410 AD. Today, he will find out for sure whether his intuition is correct. Hi, yeah. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Very well. Yourself? All right. A bit nervous. Good. Well, I know you've been waiting for this for um, you got it there. some time. So, yeah. Um, I'm not going to show you just yet. Um, these are the results from Oxford right. of the um, radiocarbon analysis. They've just come through. And the radiocarbon age is 1359 plus or minus 38 BP, which, when calibrated, gives a date range of. A Saxon. Yes, it's um, right. Cal AD 620 to 770. Right. Not the answer Mike was hoping for, because it puts the execution squarely into Saxon times, more than three centuries after the Roman period. The carbon dating has placed the execution within a 150 year time frame, but that date can be further refined using tree ring data from the Oxford University database. By combining seasonal ring counts with carbon dated samples, the system can produce a probability curve that pinpoints the execution to within 40 years. We can see from this that the tree rings which match most closely to the radiocarbon date that we've obtained are the ones in the middle of the 7th century. The graph peaks between 650 and 690 AD, a very significant time in Anglo-Saxon history during that period, missionaries from the mainland were making their way through England, trying to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. When outcasts who refused to convert were killed, they were buried unceremoniously in what had previously been lavish pagan burial grounds. It seems the newly converted Christian Anglo-Saxons believed that by burying the deviants in these pagan sites, they would damn their souls to an eternity in hell. The Sutton Hoo burial mound in East Anglia is a prime example. What really surprised us was the find of some burials which were very plain, uh, just bodies placed in graves, no, no grave goods. They were buried crouching, kneeling, lying on the back, arms in the air, and the heads, some of the heads were off, some of the heads were by the knees, some of the heads were in the right place but the wrong way round. 39 bodies were found at Sutton Hoo, and there was evidence that a gallows had existed at the site. The burials were in a ring, and in the middle of the ring were, were four post sockets. So we thought, ha, huh, uh, what must have happened here is that these people have been killed. It comes in with Christian kings, and they punish them twice, first by killing them, and secondly by burying them in a pagan burial ground. It's as though to say, right, you step out of line, you're not coming in with the new Christian kingdom, we bury you there, we bury you in the pagan burial ground. 4104 may have suffered a similar fate. His skeleton was the first evidence that Stonehenge was being used during that time period. And like Sutton Hoo, Stonehenge would have had pagan significance. It's in the middle of nowhere, in local terms. Nobody lives anywhere near here. It's a remote site. And it's on the edge of a Saxon land boundary. And these boundaries, in Saxon times, were places where there were burial mounds that we know to be perhaps three or 4,000 years old. In Saxon times, they had no idea how old they were, but they quite often related them to their own mythologies, which included people buried in mounds. And these were places sometimes of darkness and evil and fear. Stonehenge was most likely seen the same way, as a dark, mysterious remnant of an ancient time. According to 7th century literature, the Anglo-Saxons believed that Neolithic burial mounds and stone circles were thought to be haunted by evil spirits, perhaps the perfect place to execute and bury a deviant. 
The position of this burial and um, the treatment of the corpse clearly indicates this is an outcast. It's a person that is um, being basically taken away from society and buried in a place outside of society's limits. So we're seeing, first of all, a clear image that Stonehenge has become associated with fearful and superstitious ideas, a place where a deviant can be executed and buried. And it would say about the person that, that they have actually, they have been a wrongdoer of some sort and potentially of some significance as well. The coming of Christianity offers a possible explanation for 4104's burial at Stonehenge. And the emerging system of regional control provides another motive for the choice of the site. Power was evolving from a patchwork of tribal chieftains into several dominant kingdoms. The growing importance of land ownership drove the establishment of boundaries, often marked by dominant features in the landscape. Stonehenge lies very close to one such boundary within the Kingdom of Wessex. Wessex was further broken down into districts known as Hundreds, each of which was locally governed and controlled. We're effectively walking along the northern boundary of what was known as the Hundred of Swanborough in the late Anglo-Saxon period. And we know this largely through the evidence of Doomsday Book, which lists the estates. The Doomsday Book was a comprehensive 11th century text that provided the first census information for all of Britain. It catalogued property ownership and provided particulars about the boundary system that had its foundation in the 7th century, around the time of the Stonehenge execution. Kings need new forms through which to express their power and authority. They can't be everywhere at once. So the use of gallows or the display of an executed criminal, it's a permanent and lasting display of your authority. You may be on the other side of the kingdom, but a rotting corpse or a mouldering head stuck on a stake it sends a powerful message. Mike and Andrew Reynolds walk an Anglo-Saxon boundary that lies 12 miles north of Stonehenge. The site was a well-traveled crossroads, an ideal location to post a powerful message. So at this point in the Saxon document, it tells us there used to be a gallows here. Absolutely. And the terminology they use, the, the, this um, point is described as um, the uh, Weirhrud, which is um, basically an old English term or two old English words, and, and, and they basically mean the wrongdoers, um, cross or gallows. It would have been a very sort of um, evocative image, I think, to people passing by. The gallows would have looked very much like the stones at Stonehenge. So it's quite a frightening, sort of remote but dramatic physical representation of, of the law, if you like. In fact, the name Stonehenge actually derives from the Anglo-Saxon Stanhangen, meaning stone gallows. And while there is no evidence that an actual wooden gallows ever existed at Stonehenge, its menacing imagery may have served as an even more powerful backdrop for an execution. Mike has found both religious and political reasons why Stonehenge would have been chosen as the site for an execution in Anglo-Saxon times. But he still hopes to shed light on the actual reason 4104 was beheaded. He believes the answer may lie in the law codes, an emerging system of authority precipitated by the growing need to protect personal property. The law codes describe a range of offences and what you've got to do to kind of um, make up for what you've done in incredible detail. Um, in, for, for, for example, you, the, 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 the earliest Kentish laws of about 600 give you the penalty if you're walking along a street with a spear over your shoulder and you poke the fellow behind you in the eye with your spear, then there's a set payment for it. I mean, similarly, if you punch somebody and knock the teeth out, there's a set payment for that. These very specific records of crime and punishments laid the foundation for modern forms of judicial process and trial by jury. They may also provide insight into the fate of 4104. Of all the crimes committed in that bloody period, theft of property was thought to be one of the worst, an offense punishable by death. For the vast majority of offences committed throughout the Anglo-Saxon period, these could be atoned for, were atoned for, by the payment of fines. And in fact, capital punishment itself was very rarely enacted. 
the usual explanation for beheading is the fact that there was uh, that, that a great fear or superstition surrounded the particular individual, and the general explanation runs to the to, to the effect that a beheaded person wouldn't wouldn't be able to rise from the dead. So it's fear of the dead rising is the general explanation for beheaded individuals. And there were very few offences for which this could be undertaken. Um, decapitation in particular was undertaken for theft um, and we should really I think see this as theft on a grand scale um, in particular cattle rust rustling and, and the theft of movable wealth and personal, personal property. Mike has built a case that he believes explains the murder and burial of 4104 at Stonehenge. For him, the last remaining task is to finally get a sense of what the man actually looked like. But the skull is so badly damaged, high-tech computer imaging is needed to rebuild it. This optical surface scanner was originally developed in order to scan patients' faces because we wanted to monitor them before and after various sorts of facial surgery. The process of reconstructing a face from a skull is really separate from the scanning process. We start from the skull shape and I use published data about the thicknesses of tissue over various parts of the surface to extrapolate the position that the skin surface would pass through. The facial reconstruction puts the finishing touches on what has been an eye-opening investigation. Mike's work has exacted valuable clues that have allowed him to recreate this ancient crime scene and shed new light on a mysterious murder from our forgotten past. Finally pinning down the death of this man has transformed the way I think about Stonehenge. From the excavations at Stonehenge, there's absolutely no evidence that anything was happening here in the seventh century. So the discovery of this event at that time suddenly tells us that something was happening here, that people were thinking about Stonehenge, and that's, that's a huge discovery. A public execution, an early example of a burgeoning system of crime and punishment that became the foundation of modern law and order. A local man, an outcast, perhaps even a notorious thief. His sentence would have been carried out in this frightening and isolated place. This is somebody who had profoundly upset society and the community that knew him. He'd done something at a time when our very world was being shaped, our language, our laws, our landscape. He'd done something to upset people and he paid for it and ended his days in the center of what even today is an icon of our indigenous past. When they get here with the man, who knows, maybe he struggled, maybe he was already in such fear himself and given himself up to what was about to happen. Whatever the man's crime, it was thought so serious by the community that tried him that they wanted his punishment to continue after death. Banished from the new Christian burial grounds, his body was left to rot in a pagan wasteland where his executioners thought his soul would be damned for eternity. The church would have nothing to say here, but the church will have her due. But I say that this man will lie here in a consecrated ground, and he will remain forgotten, unknown, unnamed, here in this dark place. as Secrets of the Dead continues to uncover forgotten history. Modern science cracks ancient cases wide open, and there's no turning back. What caused the death in the Jamestown colony? New evidence suggests disease, distrust, and foul play. They're shooting each other? In Africa, a new look at a Zulu victory. British colonials were badly beaten and claimed to be brutally outnumbered. By bloodthirsty savages. No. No. Battlefield evidence rewrites the accepted version of events. Portuguesa! Kill them! The location of Jesus' crucifixion and burial has long been in question. Now archaeologists ask, is this the tomb of Christ? The most important place in Christianity 
has actually been ignored. Examine evidence that this church conceals the actual site of Jesus' burial and on the trail of an enduring infectious disease. Classic cases of syphilis. Exciting new detective stories where science rocks history as we uncover Secrets of the Dead. Reopen investigations of the past at PBS Online. History is revealing its forgotten secrets at pbs.org. Secrets of the Dead was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.